Mercedes-AMG is redefining the high-performance sedan and setting new standards for 2017. Our car tester Sasha will be driving an E-Class, not the regular one, but the E63 AMG, as you can immediately hear. That sumptuous sound means power, 450 kilowatts of power, or an excess of 600 horsepower for the biggest E-Class, and with torque peaking at a whopping 850 newton meters. As well as being a monster powerhouse, the E63S is also a feast for the eyes. The hood is bedded in between the bumper and the fenders, coupe style, while the restyled grille is open wide, much like on the GTR. From the rear, the AMG can be recognized by the spoiler, the white apron, and the chrome exhaust pipes. Mercedes seems to have incorporated all the gadgetry and finery available into its interior, including a variety of AMG bezels. The sports steering wheel is flattened at the bottom and has a gray 12 o'clock marking. Customizable lateral support makes the front seats more comfortable. The cylinder deactivation feature can reduce fuel consumption. But to switch it on, the comfort mode has to be activated, which tends to defeat the concept. If the 250 km per hour maximum speed isn't enough, says Sasha, buyers can order the driver's package and bump it up to 300. Not a good idea for most streets and roads, but should anyone need it for the racetrack, it's certainly available. Aber wer es braucht, kann es auf jeden Fall auch bekommen. Sasha is glad to see all the driver's assist from the E-Class in the AMG. Anyone who wants to hang on to their driver's licenses might do well to use them more often, whether fully or partly automatic. They at least reduce the danger of speeding. But if you really want, you can accelerate from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 3.4 seconds. Bear in mind that the fuel consumption, rated at 8.8 .8 liters per 100 kilometers, is simply unrealistic outside the lab. The exact price for this car is not yet known, but it's likely to be well over 100,000 euros. On the racetrack of Portimao, the E63S can cut loose and show what it's capable of. We just have to switch cars. They assured us that it was just to warm up the tires and brakes, but aside from that, this AMG is identical to our test car. With a professional driver at the wheel, the AMG's handling and performance are truly impressive. For the E-Class, the AMG engineers modified the V8, adding two twin-scroll turbochargers and refining the cylinders and engine software. The speed shift transmission is a wet, start-off multi-disc clutch instead of a power-wasting torque converter. The standard all-wheel drive comes with fully variable torque distribution, dispatching the thrust right where it's needed. The three-chamber air body control suspension self-levels and improves handling. The result, no wobbles, stutters, or crackles. Reluctant to spoil experienced drivers' fun, the folks at Mercedes put in a drift mode. It moves all the thrust onto the rear wheels and puts the transverse force back into the curves, at the expense of speed, but adding a little extra fun. Former motorsports ace Ben Schneider imagines the AMG as a car for daily use. Before taking it onto the racetrack, a driver should get to know it very well. 
There's a range of dynamic select settings. So with Sport Plus, you have ESP turned on, where you should exercise a lot of caution because this really is a car that is a joy to drive. It's very forgiving, but it can achieve high speeds, so the driver has to know what they're doing. The CES in Las Vegas is one of the world's largest consumer electronics trade fairs. As you can see here, even cars are evolving more and more into computers on wheels. Car tester Matas Kura reminds us that NVIDIA has become one of the leading makers of graphic cards, but not many people know it makes a chip, like the one in this laptop, that can improve traffic safety. Here at the CES, the automotive industry and its suppliers can display their state-of-the-art technology for helping and protecting drivers and passengers. ZF CEO Stefan Zomer says artificial intelligence can be used to prevent traffic accidents. It can communicate with smartphones and wearables, for example, and recognize vulnerable road users like pedestrians and bike riders before the driver is even able to see them and by using their connectivity to the vehicle, they can help prevent an accident. Artificial intelligence can also help the driver sort out complicated traffic situations and learn to respond correctly to entirely new situations. BMW is at the CES demonstrating clever studies that embody a new style of driving. Olga Hunt says BMW realizes that autonomous driving in electric cars will lead to new user experiences in the car segment. The company is exploring how these experiences could feel in a car. One result is a car's interior that brings the living room into the mobility of tomorrow, combining the latest technology with comfort. This vision of the future has been made a reality in a BMW 5 series. Tester Matis points out that this isn't any normal Beamer 5. It's a kind of time machine. Ronald Ecker agrees, saying the time machine takes us to the year 2022. BMW demonstrates the present-day reality of autonomous driving on a route through Las Vegas. Matis asks what advantage is it for him to drive autonomously. Of course, he can turn around and talk to his passengers or stick a pacifier into a kid's mouth. He wonders what other possibilities are open to him. Peter Waldmann explains that since you can look away from the road and even take your hands off the wheel, the car becomes a kind of smart living room that integrates functions and services familiar from digital life outside the vehicle. Mercedes also has its visions of and for the future. The magic word here is case. Ola Kalinius explains that CASE stands for four megatrends in the automotive industry for the coming five to ten years. Connectivity, autonomy, shared services, and electric drive. Mercedes is focusing on comfort and wellness for the passengers. With the motto, fit and healthy, they're demonstrating the possibilities in their high-end Maybach model. Mata says he wouldn't have thought it possible to exit a Mercedes-Benz Maybach even more relaxed than he already does after riding here and back. But obviously, the engineers at Daimler had some new ideas. He feels relaxing vibrations all down his back, like magic fingers. Volkswagen, too, is breaking new ground. Mata says this digital key works on more or less any smartphone, so with a special VW app you can give your friends the right to use your car, and even limit the time if you want. But it also lets you change the decor. Before you even reach the car, you can decide that you want blue lights in the door today instead of red lights, and then the car will reset them for you. And the multimedia features almost let you talk to the car in natural language. Wo ich nämlich wirklich in fast natürlicher Sprache mit dem Fahrzeug reden kann. VW, 
Let's go to San Francisco. Okay, I am calculating the route to San Francisco. The route is long. Shall I look for a gas station? Yes, please. Okay, also to a gas station. So, then can jetzt also so Montes would be ready to head to San Francisco, except that he can't drive away here with all these people standing around. And he says the functions will only be introduced into the various VW models over the next few years, one at a time. Skoda went into 2017 with a makeover for its Octavia. Apart from the facelift to the front and rear, the compact car boasts a significant boost to its infotainment. Skoda Connect networks it with mobile online services. The new Octavia offers four gasoline and four diesel-powered engines and goes on sale in Germany in March. BMW presents the G310R, its new under 500cc model for the entry-level segment. The small headlight, fairing and the roadster proportions with a striking front section and dynamic rear give the G310R a presence on the road. The relaxed seating position makes a spin on this lightweight powerhouse a pleasure on both city and country roads. Our current reviewer Enos notes that more and more makers of luxury and highly coveted sports sedans are breaking out of the confines of their long-established brand images. Bentley calls its new SUV the Bentayga. Maserati's is the Levant. Today, she'll be testing the Jaguar F-Pace to see if the sizable compact crossover strikes the balance between elegance, image, and sportiness. This spectacular video secured an entry in the Guinness Book of World Records for the Jaguar F-Pace, when it strutted its stuff with a rather impressive stunt at its world premiere in September 2015. Every parameter, the angle of approach, the precise dimensions of the track, and the exact speed of the F-Pace as it rounded the 19-meter high loop, had been meticulously worked out by a team of mathematicians and safety experts over a period of months. The F-Pace was setting the bar extremely high with this feat, and it wasn't even pulling out the big guns to do it. It didn't take the loop with the model's biggest gasoline-powered engine, the 280-kilowatt V6, but the lightest powerhouse, the 2-liter 132-kilowatt diesel, the one we'll be testing today. It takes this F-Pace from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 8.7 seconds and hits maximum speed at 208. The F-Pace's exterior makes the beefy impression we've come to expect of an SUV, while the air intakes and the apron give it a sporty touch. Overall, it has the air of a true Jaguar. The long, bulging hood speaks Jaguar's design language. The tailgate-mounted rear spoiler and sloping sedan roofline bring the contours to a sporty conclusion, with taillights following the typical Jaguar design cues. Inside are a class-leading 650 liters of luggage space. With the rear seats folded down, even these meter and a half long exercise bars will fit. The rear seats are every bit as spacious. The elevated position helps make getting in easier than in almost any other model Jag. Head and leg room is more than sufficient. Enos appreciates the interior design with Jaguar's usual horizontal array of switches, of which there are conveniently few, sometimes maybe even too few. There's only one button for the heat on two seats. Press it, and a window opens on the monitor, allowing the temperature to be adjusted separately for each seat. As soon as the engine starts, the rotary drive controller raises from the center console. 
The ambient lighting can be set to individual tastes in keeping with Jaguar's innovative clear design. The selection of the driving mode also affects both the lighting and the digital instrument cluster display. The F-Pace is based on the same modular lightweight aluminum architecture as the XE and XF sedans. The standard torque vectoring system that Jaguar originally developed for the F-Type sports car makes for a snappy but safe ride. Ina says that the engineer's strategy for the Jaguar F-Pace started with the sports car and enhanced its practicality for everyday driving. She's satisfied that they succeeded. The ample luggage space and room for five people makes it a very practical car. She happens to be driving the smallest engine with an eight-speed automatic transmission, and she finds that she has to really step on the gas to get the car up to speed. She misses some of the typical Jaguar feeling of the perkier models. On this one, you do notice the weight it carries. But what you get is a Jaguar with lots of room and practicality. And this big cat is comfortable as well. The park assist will guide the car to and all the way into a parking spot in reverse gear. All the driver has to do is work the brakes and accelerator. Ina sums up the F-Pace as a successful blend of design, elegance, and sportiness. And of course, it's nice to know you can loop the loop if you need to. But generally, you'd use the car for everyday town and country driving. And she'd recommend one of the bigger engines to anyone looking for more of the Jaguar feeling and pizzazz. <laughs> The Saab 99 Turbo, a prime example of Swedish engineering. Saab, which started out as an aircraft manufacturer, presented its first automobile prototype, the Orsop, in 1947. That famous Scandinavian attention to detail meant it was another 20 years until the next genuinely new model was launched. As Christoph Bauer puts it, when the Saab 99 was born in 1967, the media was delighted with the solid, compact build and modern engineering. He quotes the Swiss weekly trade journal Automobile Revue from 1969. It's hard to find a more responsibly built vehicle. And the Saab 99 grew into the darling of individualists, freelancers, and academics. But even for that kind of clientele, Christoph says, 118 horsepower was too little. So Saab turned to brand new turbocharger technology to coax more out of the four-cylinder engine. The Saab 99 Turbo was a pioneer. The only European production models with turbochargers at the time were BMW's 2002 Turbo, introduced in 1973, and the Porsche 911 Turbo from 1974. For Christoph, the big difference between Porsche and BMW with their high-flying sports models and Saab was that the Swedes were the first to put a turbocharger in a mid-sized family sedan and trim down the innovative technology for everyday use. They proceeded carefully, first giving turbo prototypes to 100 drivers from the public and letting them clock up four and a half million kilometers. And it was a success. The Saab 99 Turbo is reliable and robust as the proverbial Swedish steel. Despite its respectable 145 horsepower, the 99 Turbo was no sensation on the sporting front. The turbocharger moved Saab into the performance executive range upper middle class without its having to develop a costly six-cylinder engine. The motto was torque, not horsepower, Christoph explained, so drivers don't get that sudden turbo kick. Instead, the charger starts to build up pressure at just 1,500 RPM. By 3,000 revs, it's already reached its maximal pressure boost, a moderate 0.7 bar. 
The result is 23% more power and above all, 45% more torque. And that's what counts for everyday use. This is Trento's Le Albert district, designed by star architect Renzo Piano, an appropriate backdrop for the functional Swedish car. You may not be very fast in a Saab 99 turbo, says Kristoff, but you're very safe, like in a high security cell with a cushioned dashboard and even a double jointed steering column. To prevent knee injuries, the ignition lock was moved here behind the gear shift. But the real highlight for Kristoff are the ergonomically formed seats with the head restraints, not a typical feature of a 1960s compact executive car. He gets out to point out some special features that any connoisseur will recognize as belonging to the top-of-the-range model. A lower chassis, wider tires, and the so-called Inca rims, its pyramid design symbolizing the rotor blades of the turbocharger. And to optimize all that turbo power on the road, the car has a few spoilers. The Saab 99 was the last model designed by Sixten Saison, the celebrated Swedish industrial designer. It's considered the quintessential Saab, safe, aerodynamically sound, and solid, but a touch eccentric as well. The interior is unconventional, but cozy and well-equipped. This top version has a leather steering wheel and a turbo boost gauge. And now Christoph is ready to show us the turbo revolution. Voila. Down here we have two rotor blades rotating up to 90,000 times a minute. The one on the turbine side is driven by the exhaust current and via a shaft it operates the other rotor blade on the compressor side. That forces extra air into the combustion chamber. More air, more fuel, more power. <laughs> Ingenious. And in a further innovation, the relatively small charger has a fast response time, eliminating the feared turbo gap. The technology enabled this pioneering vehicle to sprint from 0 to 100 in just under 10 seconds, and the car continues accelerating up to 198 kilometers per hour. The Saab 99 Turbo brought 145 horsepower onto the road. One problem, according to Christoph, was the front wheel drive, which affects the steering. When it's wet, the Swedish car does tend to paw the ground with its front hooves, as he put it. And, in general, it understeers. That's good from a safety point of view, but he can see why a sporty driver might be underwhelmed by the handling and also by the somewhat cumbersome steering and stiff gear shift. And then there's the hefty price of over 25,000 Deutschmarks at the time. Back then, that could buy you a BMW 528i with six cylinders and more than 180 horsepower, or two VW Scirocco's with standard equipment. So all in all, the Saab 99 Turbo was a car for wealthy individualists. In just five years of production, from 1977 to 1982, precisely 10,607 such solvent individuals chose a Saab 99 Turbo. When the Saab 99 Turbo debuted in 1977, it was rightly considered the first production sedan with a turbo engine for everyday use. Modern car production wouldn't be possible without the power-boosting turbines. And look at downsizing, says Christoph. The idea of using fewer cylinders and smaller engine sizes wouldn't be possible without turbocharging turbines. The Saab 99 Turbo is the primordial ancestor of today's turbo-boosted cars, and definitely a milestone in automotive history. In the long run, though, the Saab brand didn't manage to profit from all those pioneering achievements. In 2011, the Swedish carmaker filed for bankruptcy. Its future remains uncertain.